scripture reading for this morning is Psalm 119, verses 145 through 152. I cried with all my heart, answer me, O Lord, I will observe your statutes. I cried to you, save me, and I will keep your testimonies. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for your words. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. Revive me, O Lord, according to your ordinances. Those who follow after wickedness draw near. They are far from your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Of old I have known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. God, again, I pray you would use your word in our lives, that you would strengthen us, that you would teach us. God, I pray that you would shape us using your word today. We pray this again in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this section, Psalm 119, 145 through 152, is the 19th section of Psalm 119, this long, long psalm about God's word and about God's people and even more importantly about God, about God himself. Uh, as uh, all of the sections before this, this section, all eight verses, start with a particular letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The 19th section of the psalm all start with, all eight of these verses start with the 19th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the, the, the letter Kaf uh, means axe or axe head or battle axe. And I have one. I brought one. Uh, I have one with me. And <clears throat> there are several different kinds. I'm coming over here. Sorry about that, Matt. There are several different kinds of axes. Um, and the... The axe used in the, uh, in the Middle East, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, was a, a two-edged axe. And so this is the closest thing I have um, to, uh, to what that axe would be. And the axe was, I'm going to put it over here, the axe was a, a tool, is a tool, uh, and it is a weapon. And if we're, if we're honest, I mean, you know, you see somebody, you see somebody with a gun, that's bad. I mean, that's bad, well, that's bad. You see somebody with an axe, and somehow, for some reason, that's badder. And, and, and somehow that is, that is more uh, fearsome, if you would. Um, the, the axe was and is a valuable tool uh, in the Middle East. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, a, a strange account uh, Elisha the prophet, who is speaking for God and, and, and doing miracles of God and, and gathering people. Not surprisingly, he had a, a group of disciples uh, called the sons of the prophets. And they, they lived near him. And they just, wherever he went, he went. Because they wanted to hear his preaching and teaching. And they wanted to see his miracles. And they wanted to be a part of what God was doing. And they came to him one day and they said, The place where we're staying near you is too small. Give us permission to go down to the Jordan River, and each of us will cut down a tree, and, and we'll use that wood to make a, to make a new house. And, and Elisha said, yeah, go ahead. And they said, well, please come with us. And he said, okay, I'll go. And they were there, and they're next to the Jordan River, and they're chopping trees. And it, it actually says that one of them yelled, alas, my, my, my Lord, talking to the prophet. And what had happened was as he was swinging his axe, the axe head had had come off and had gone out into the river and had sunk, of course. And, uh, and he said, oh, he said I, I, I've lost my axe head, and it was borrowed. It's not even mine. And Elisha says, okay, where, about where did it go in? He kind of points, it's somewhere out there. And Elisha threw a stick in on top of the water, and the iron axe head floated and came over to them. He's like, What? I, that shows a couple things in the context, in the context, because the right before that, right before that, God, God does this um, uh, amazing uh, miracle of, of, of revealing, excuse me, right after uh, uh, amazing miracle of revealing the hosts of heaven to Elisha's servant and then blinds the armies that are attacking Israel 
Uh, and, and so there's this national miracle. And, and right before it, God had healed a leper and then given a healthy man leprosy. And so we see God's judgment and God's mercy. And then right in the middle of it, a guy loses his tool. And God, God does a miracle and I think a couple things that shows it, uh, encouragement is that, that the small, quote, quote, small details in our lives are, are important to the Lord. And it does show us that an axe was a valuable thing. An axe was a, a valuable tool. An axe head is, is valuable to God. It is the axe, the, the, two, the two-edged axe is the tool that is used by Old Testament and New Testament carpenters. You know, if you go into a, 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 a carpenter's or a woodworker's wood shop now, they've got tools everywhere, and, and you watch the shows, and the guy's got all the right, and they got, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of tools. A, a good carpenter in Jesus' day had an ax, and he used it to chop. He used it to, to, to cut. He used it to shape. He used it to plane, he used it to sand, he used it to mold a piece of wood into the shape that was useful to him, the carpenter. Most carpenters and builders kept an especially sharp axe for cutting and shaping and making useful. It is what Jesus would have used, it's what Joseph would have used uh, to shape wood. And the axe was a, a weapon. It was a weapon. Uh, many of the soldiers in Old Testament times had a battle axe. It was used for defense, and it was used as an offensive weapon, and it was used as an instrument, a weapon of judgment. In Jeremiah 26.9, God talks about taking the axe to wicked Tyre. He talks in Jeremiah 46, 22 of, of taking the axe to Egypt. In Deuteronomy 20, verses 19 and 20, in giving instructions to his people about war, God actually said, when you lay siege to a city, when you lay siege to a city and you need wood to, to build your fortifications, use an axe and cut down all the trees around the city. Listen to what God said. Except fruit trees. Cut down all the trees and use them, those trees, use that wood to destroy the city, but do not cut down fruit trees because they are useful and will be needed. And then in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist comes and John the Baptist is preaching. And John the Baptist comes in Matthew chapter 3, and in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when John saw that many of the Pharisees and Sadducees were coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit <clears throat> in keeping with repentance. Do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Listen to what he says. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Later he says, one will come and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The battle axe was used to defend as the, as the enemy got very close. It was used to defend. It was used to attack. It was what was carried when the first line broke in through the defenders of the enemy. They took the battle axe, and it was used for judgment. That's the context here 
if you would. That's the literary context of Psalm 119, these verses right here. This, this axe that is used to shape, it's used to defend, it's used to destroy, it's used for judgment. And that really, to be honest with you, that explains the, the thrust of David's prayer here in verse 145. I cried with all my heart, answer me, O Lord, I will observe your statutes. I cried to you, save me, and I will keep your testimonies. This is what he's saying. I, I cried out to you with my whole heart. I, I cried out. The word there is actually a, a vocal prayer. Since you guys are here, I can do this. I can't, it's so awkward like to, you know, when it's just a camera because nobody raises their hand. How many of y'all have ever been praying, and if you lie in church, how many of y'all have ever been praying and laying in bed at night, praying silently, how many of y'all have ever been praying and fallen asleep in the middle of your prayer? Okay, very good, thank you. The rest of you are liars. All right. How how many of y'all have ever been praying, you know, silently praying, and you're laying in bed, silently praying, and just started thinking about something completely else, and just realized right in the middle... I was praying. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask for how many of you, don't raise your hand on this, had to ask for forgiveness about what you were thinking. All right, I'm not going to ask that, okay? But I don't fall asleep when I'm actually praying out loud. I, I, maybe I do. I don't know. Maybe, 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 you know, I don't know if you've ever just been praying and, you know, and gotten, you know, and just fall. There's something about praying out loud, that, that, that keeps us focused. It, 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 he is crying out. It's a, 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 it, it, is a, it is a passionate prayer. The word for crying means I'm wailing. I'm wailing before you. My whole heart, with, with, with all of my being, I, I, I'm, I'm intense. This is intense prayer. Uh, an example of that would be Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion, where he falls to the ground and he prays so hard that his sweat came off of him like blood. Listen to what he's praying here. I I cried to you with with all my heart. Answer me, O Lord. I will observe your statutes. I cried, save me, and I will keep your testimonies. Answer me, and I will do what you say. David's prayer here is a prayer for obedience. He's not praying for forgiveness. Though he needs that, he's, he's, not, he's, not, he's not praying for salvation. David, as a believer, is crying out, work in me, rescue me, change me, shape me, use your axe on me, cause me, cause me to be obedient. Now, again, the literary context here is that God uses his axe as a judgment. And if you bear fruit... It's one thing, and if you don't bear fruit, then God chops you down. And, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a judgment on the wicked, and it's a tool to shape those that are his. And with that context, David, David here says, David, David, David acknowledges his sinfulness, his own bent towards sinning. He, he acknowledges his own failings that, uh, that he has given to sin, and he has been involved in sin, and he knows that he will fail and fall and give in again, and he, he acknowledges the power and the attractiveness of sin. So his, his prayer here, I want you to hear, his prayer here is make me obedient. Make me obedient. He, he's not saying do this and I'll be obedient. What he's saying is do this in me so that I'll be obedient. You do this in me. I, I want to do what you want me to do. That's what David's saying. I want to do what you say. I just don't. I want you to make me obedient. Please. <clears throat> I'm wailing here. Make me <clears throat> obedient. Listen to, how he, listen to how he prays. Look at verse 147. <clears throat> I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for your words. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. I rise before dawn. My eyes anticipate the night watches. I rise before dawn while it's still dark. First thing in the day, first thing I get up, I get up first thing, most important, I want to get this done. My eyes anticipate the night watches, the watches that go through the night. I'm going to stay up all night to get this done. When our family is going to go on a trip, certainly a long trip, 
the argument in our house is always how early are we going to leave? And <clears throat> it's either early or very early or the night before. But that's when we're leaving. Uh, it, 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 we're going to get going as quick as we can to get as many miles as we can in before sunlight because somehow that's better and, and we're, and we're going to go. <clears throat> I would assume lots of y'all have gotten up while it was still dark with great excitement. With great excitement. It usually has to do with going out and killing something. It usually has to do with going out and fishing. You know, it, has, it has to do with something that we want to do. And so we get up earlier than we normally do, but we get up with great excitement. This, this is what I'm talking about. We're going to go. He says here, I get up while it is still dark, <clears throat> and I cry out to you. My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Listen to what he's saying. I I'm going to stay up all night. I'm going to stay up all night. I'm going to pull an all-nighter. I'm going to stay up all night to meditate on your word. The, the, the value of God's word. I want you to understand here, he says here, I anticipate the night watches. It's, it's not just valuable, it's, it's not just important, it's also the joy and excitement of studying God's word. <clears throat> it is a privilege and a rare, unbelievable opportunity to come before the Lord. I had a friend over last night and we talked for, talked for a long time and we got ready to go, and he got ready to go, and, and I said, let me, let me pray for you. Let me pray for us, and I just busted right in there and thanked the Lord for, for this, this, this buddy of mine and thanked the Lord for his ministry and prayed, prayed a couple things and said amen. And then he said, let me pray for you. And I said, well, okay. And he spent the first several minutes just thanking God for the unbelievable opportunity that God would allow two folks like us to come before him in his presence. And I actually thought, you know, I, I, I jump right in there, you know, hey, God, I got a couple things I got to say and, 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 and get out. And I, I forget that it is a rare privilege. I'll be honest with you, I think we forget about that here. I mean, this, this, this thing right here, and I think having not been able to do it for a while, I don't know about y'all, but I was, I was pretty fired up about coming back to see people that like two and a half months ago, I wasn't that fired up about seeing y'all every Sunday. I'd see y'all, like, well, there you are again, still looking old. I mean, I'd, I'd, <clears throat> and yet, and yet, it's a rare opportunity to get to come. To, it's a rare privilege to come before the throne of God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, and not only be able to come before him, but to be welcomed, to be invited to be called by him to come before him and into his presence. Verse 149, hear my voice according to your loving kindness, O Lord, according to your hased, according to your covenant love, according to your relational promise-making, promise-keeping love, based on that. Based on that, we can come. Hebrews 4 says that we can come confidently before the throne of God because of our high priest, Jesus Christ. Because of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Notice the importance of God's word here in, in verse 147 and 148. I, I rise early. I rise before dawn to cry for help. I wait for or I hope for your words. My, my eyes anticipate the night watches that I might meditate on on your word that I might meditate that I might read and study and reflect and say back to you and speak about and discuss and focus on your word 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17 says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching for reproof for correction for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate equipped for every good work. God uses his word to reveal himself to us. He uses his word to shape us and to make us more conformed to the image of Christ. Look at the encouragement in prayer here in verses 150 and 151. 
Those who follow after wickedness draw near. They are far from your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Those who follow after wickedness draw near. Those who are disobedient and arrogant about their rebellion. Those who are wicked and do evil and are far from God and far from God's word and far from good. And I think we are... I think we are sometimes surprised at how wicked people can be and and, and the level of wickedness. And David here says that those that are wicked, those that are far from you, those that follow wickedness, they draw near. Wicked people and wicked society and the, the snares and traps of the enemy are drawing near. They're getting closer. They're all around. Can't avoid them. I know they're coming and they're drawing closer and they are real threats. And listen to what he says. Those threats are drawing near. Verse 151. You are near. O Lord. Y'all hear this. The threat draws near. God is near. The wicked come closer to you and to your family and to your loved ones. And to your church, the evil one desires to destroy you, and he he draws near. Listen, and God is near. They come close. God is close. The threats get closer. God is still closer. God is near. God is with us. In Psalm 23, David says, the the Lord is my shepherd. And then later in the psalm, he says, listen, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God, the, the shepherd, chooses to be close to us. And because of that, we have nothing to fear. When I was growing up, and <clears throat> I hate to admit this, I'm, I'm pretty well grown now. Um, I still have a little fear of the dark, um, or a lot of fear of the dark. When I was growing up, I had a whole bunch of fear of the dark, and uh, just didn't like being out in the dark. And every now and then, my, 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 my dad would say, hey, take, you know, take the trash out or something, and, and, and that was out. That was out of ways, and, 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 and we, lived, we lived way out, and, and, and I would be outside in the dark, and it was scary. Now, hang with me. We had a concrete driveway, and I didn't know why he did this until I tried it, but my dad would lay, go out there in the evening, in the cool of the evening, and he would lay on the driveway because the driveway would absorb heat during the day, and it was actually kind of warm. And so when my dad got done his work for the day and before we, and as everything was kind of quieting down every now and then, I, we'd look around, he wouldn't, and, and he'd, he'd be out on the driveway. And I cannot tell you the number of times... I went out into the same dark, the same scary sounds with all those wild animals out there, wherever they are, cows probably. And and yet, because he was there, I could lay down on the the driveway and I could hear him. And and it it was cool to listen to the very same things that terrified me if he wasn't out there. I can remember a couple of times when, when my sons were little and, and they wanted to go do something and they wanted to do it because it was scary and mischievous and possibly right on the edge of not being right. And, and being the good father that I said, I said, well, listen, you can go do that, but I'm coming with you. And they said, that would be better, actually. And, and so we went and we did this scary, possibly wrong thing. And I got done, I said, hey, that really was kind of cool. And they said, no, it wasn't. It wasn't scary at all, because you were here. See, there's something about the one that you trust being right there, being right there. In, In Matthew 28, Jesus' last appearance to his disciples, and and, and his disciples know it's the last time, And, and when Jesus came up to them, it says they, they saw him and they, they fell down and worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Some of them were scared. Some of them know this is the last time. He's already told us he's not going to be with us anymore. And Jesus came up to them, knowing what they were thinking, and spoke to them saying, listen to what he says, All authority 
has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And listen to what it says. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says there is nowhere in heaven or on earth, and that's the only two places a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ can go, anywhere on the earth and heaven, anywhere you can possibly go, I am already in charge. I'm absolutely in charge. So go and make disciples. And you know what? I will always, 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 always be with you. I will never not be with you. So hang with me here. Our, our enemies, our wicked society, our own sinfulness sometimes draws pretty close. And the consequences of our own sin, sometimes we can see them coming. Our God and our creator and our father and our savior and our shepherd and our defender is closer. And he stands there with his battle axe and he says, I will defend you. I will take care of you. You, you have nothing to fear. May our great shepherd God, who is always near, may our great covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, may he use his acts, may he use his sharp word in our lives to shape us, to mold us, to make us more like Christ, to cause us to obey. And may he use that same axe to defend you and me, his sheep. Let's pray. Guy, thank you <clears throat> that you are the mighty God. You are the warrior God. You are the shepherd of the sheep. You are the perfect father that protects his children. And God, I, I pray that you would use your acts, your word in our lives. <clears throat> I pray that you would cause each of us here, God, to be obedient. God, I pray for those that are here today, those that are listening, those that are watching. God, I pray for believers today, God, I pray that you would use your word <clears throat> to make us obedient, to make us holy, to, to, to change us and give us a great love for your word and a great love for prayer and a great love for you. And God, I pray if there are those here today, those that are listening to this, that are outside of Christ, God, I pray that you would use your word and you would draw them to yourself. God, I pray that you would warn them of the acts of judgment to come and that you would use that warning, that coming judgment, to draw them to yourself even today. God, we thank you for the gift of faith that you've given so many of us here, and I pray that we would respond in ways that are more pleasing and honoring to you. Again, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue to worship, I'd invite you to stand. Hymn 132 is all hail the power of Jesus' name.